the Ateneo Law Alumni Association as a bold from its image of a boys club in the early years to the image of an active alumni association of men and women for others. I think it's very important to remember that the ally performs a very important education value. The education of our graduates ends not with graduation, but with their continuing practice in introduction into the legal world. This is a big task, but I believe everything is possible as long as you believe in our dear Lord. And as Athenian lawyers, we do believe, and with your help, we will be able to do it. Let us continue to be men and women for others. Join the Alliance. Join us. Join us. Join us. Join us.
the Ateneo Law Alumni Association has evolved from its image of a boys club in the early years to the image of an active alumni association of men and women for others. I think it's very important to remember that the ally performs a very important education value. The education of our graduates ends not with graduation, but with their continuing practice in introduction into the legal world. This is a big task, but I believe Everything is possible as long as you believe in our dear Lord. And as Athenian lawyers, we do believe. And with your help, we will be able to do it. Let us continue to be men and women for others. Join the Alliance. Join us. Join us. Join us. Join us. The Ateneo Law Alumni Association has evolved from its image of a boys club in the early years to the image of an active alumni association of men and women for others. I think it's very important to remember that the ally performs a very important education value. 
the education of our graduates and not with graduation, but with their continuing practice in introduction into the legal world. This is a big task, but I believe everything is possible as long as you believe in our dear Lord. And as Athenian lawyers, we do believe, and with your help, we will be able to do it. Let us continue to be men and women for others. Join the Alliance. Join us. Join us. Join us. Good afternoon to all of the viewers here at the Ateneo Law Alumni Association Facebook page. Welcome once again to the web lecture series. This web lecture series is a project of the Ateneo Law Alumni Association in keeping with our mission to promote passion for justice and advance legal education. If you have been learning while enjoying the web lecture series with us from the beginning, you would have noticed that we also use this occasion to inform everyone of our other current projects being undertaken by the association. Alongside educating the public, we translate knowledge and expertise into action and service to the public by rendering legal aid services and advancing humane living conditions by decongesting our jails. Any help that you can give will go a long way in realizing the objectives of our worthwhile projects. The web lecture series is launched on this channel to allow a wide reach to an expanded audience. It is different from other webinars that we see out there because we aim to educate the public on new and relevant laws using different formats. We started with a step-by-step -step litigation brought to us by Justice Maria Filomena Singh, where we learned the revised rules of civil procedure that became effective last May 2020. This two-part lecture was followed by the do's and don'ts for LGUs under the Bayanian Act, where attorney Alberto Agra brought clarity on the state of affairs and laws and shared legal remedies with the confused public trying to survive in a society radically altered by this unprecedented pandemic. Then we had a panel discussion on the new bill that was fodder for a lot of concerned discussions, the anti-terrorism bill. 
The online forum was designed to educate the public as well as to render assistance to the agencies of government to help the people understand the law, its constitutionality, how it will affect the people and its implications on the stakeholders. Today, we will have our fourth session in our series. We started this series with the changes in our civil procedure. Now, we will be learning about the latest in criminal procedure. Criminal procedure in action will be presented to us by our moderator in our last online session, the indefatigable action man, Attorney Tranquil Salvador. Attorney Tranquil Salvador is a member of the Board of Trustees of the Ateneo Law Alumni Association. He is a law practitioner, a litigator, a law professor in several law colleges, including the Ateneo, a former College of Law Dean, a TV and radio show host, author of a book on today's topic, Criminal Procedure, so please check out the bookstores for his book. And in the 2018 bar examinations, Attorney Tranquil was a bar examiner in remedial law. I say indefatigable because Attorney Tranquil's passion for the law is evident in his many engagements, and how he does all of these things defies the laws of time and motion. On behalf of the Ateneo Law Alumni Association, headed by our chairman, Teddy Cruz, and President Nena Rosales, allow me to formally open today's lecture on criminal procedure and welcome our lecturer today, Attorney Tranquil Salvador. Good afternoon to everyone. Thank you, Dean Mary, for that introduction. Uh, but before I proceed, I would like, of course, to thank, and we have to thank Ateneo Law Alumni Association which actually sponsored this uh, webinar for this afternoon. And this is headed by our chairman, Attorney Teddy Cruz, and our president, Nena Rosales. And uh, of course, uh, we have to mention those who are very helpful uh, in our backstage, Dean Mary and uh, Attorney Joseph Negrino, and Anvik, who has been uh, in full support on all of these activities of Alay. Now, let me just lay down certain guidelines before I proceed with this afternoon's uh, discussion. Number one is that I know some lawyers will be listening this afternoon. I hope that you will learn or get some practical lessons from experiences in relation to our discussion of the law. And second, I know that there are some students here listening also, not only from Ateneo, from, but from different law schools. I hope that you'll be mindful of the provisions of the law as I mentioned it, and the examples. I hope that at the end of this discussion, we are able to add to your knowledge of the law. And number three, those who just love the law, who would like to listen to a discussion of the law, may not be a lawyer, may not be a law student, I hope that in some way, we will be guiding you in making conclusions, not only on matters of law, but also on current events which have legal issues. And I would like at this point in time to highlight the, one of the important objectives of ALAI and our board, we have to thank our board, that one of our primary advocacies and objective is to educate the public. In order not to waste so much of my time, I will now proceed with our discussion. You will see on the board right now an outline, okay, an outline of, of, of what I intend to discuss. I will discuss this in the next two hours. Uh, just Look at the outline, and I will, every time I move on to another topic, I'll mention it so that you're aware that I moved on to another topic. Because if you're not aware that I moved on to another topic, chances are you're confused with my discussion. Okay. So let me start with, to my mind, something that is very important for a uh, practitioner and which a law student should know. This is found in Rule 110, Section 1. And this is institution of criminal action. I recall some lawyers having this problem. And it's not only once that I uh, saw them having this problem, maybe a couple of times. I, there was a lawyer who approached me who said, Sabi niya, pare, parang may irregular dito ah. Sabi niya, there's something irregular in what's happening. I did not receive, my client did not receive a subpoena. And we were not required to file a counter affidavit. There is already a warrant of arrest. So then on reaction, yeah. So there was irregular at the level of the office of the prosecutor. And why did the judge issue? Why did the judge issue a warrant of arrest when there is no preliminary investigation? Now, wait, that's why we have to study rule 100, 
Rule 110, Section 1, because it tells us how to institute a criminal action. And in, in determining where to file it, it's very important to know, are you in Manila or are you in a chartered city? So if you are in Manila or practically the entire Metro Manila, when you file a case, you always file with the office of the prosecutor. Okay, simply lang yon. With the office of the prosecutor. However, you will have to take note that not all cases require preliminary investigation. I would want to be very clear with that. Not all cases would require preliminary investigation. At this point in time, I would have to state that the threshold is at least four years, two months, and one day. So all offenses with a penalty of at least four years, two months, and one day would have to go through preliminary investigation. But there are those offenses which are below four years, two months, and one day. For example, simple slander. Simple slander by deed. Malicious mischief. Some of these would even fall under the rule on summary procedure. And even BP-22, and what does it say? There is no need of preliminary investigation. But ang tanong mo sa akin, do you still file before the office of the prosecutor? Definitely in Manila or in a charter city. So don't be surprised if you don't receive a subpoena. And then there's already information, or in some cases, not summary procedure, not requiring preliminary investigation, and there is already a warrant of arrest. There is nothing irregular. In fact, the prosecutor has the power to dismiss the same. And I've seen cases where, uy, may kaso pala. Dinismiss lang na office of the prosecutor. So kindly take note of those other cases that requires preliminary investigation. In those cases, expect, if the case is not dismissed by the prosecutor's office, a subpoena. Okay? For you to file a counter of a within a period of 10 days. So that is in Manila or a charter city. But of course, not all cases are in Manila. Alam niyo naman yon, di ba? Hindi lahat ng kaso ay nasa Manila. Meron yan outside of a chartered city or outside of Manila, meaning in the provinces. Now, do we follow the same rule? Kindly take note of this. You only file with the office of the prosecutor if it requires preliminary investigation. Okay? Some of you may be lawyers under the 1985 rules of criminal procedure. Yun po ang tinapos namin. Yung mga nag-graduate ng bago ng amendment ito in the year 2000. So before the time, a judge could still, a municipal trial court judge can still conduct preliminary investigation. But not anymore. Can you take note? This has already been amended. This is provided for in Rule 112, Section 2. Mamaya, tingnan ninyo, titignan nyo, wala na enumeration, enumeration doon na municipal trial court judges. So only prosecutor, so you file it in the office of the prosecutor. If the nature of the offense is like, let us say the offense is murder, a serious illegal detention, kidnapping, arson, do ng file mo. Okay? Now, if it does not require preliminary investigation outside of Manila or a chartered city, sa probinsya, pwede mo ba file directly? Can you file directly with the uh, court? Yes. And according to the lingo of our prosecutors, ang tawag dyan ay ano? Ang tawag dyan is direct filing. But you will ask me, can I still file with the office of the prosecutor? If you wish. If you wish. But it will not require preliminary investigation. But you could go directly to the court and prosecutors call that as direct filing. And at that point in time, the court will have to determine whether problem, there's probable cause. Kaya may kaso na yun. Now, having said that, okay, always remember at least four years, two months, and one day. I will now move on to my next topic. And my next topic is, what is your remedy for a defective information? As you know, a lawyer who has been trained in criminal procedure or in criminal law, the first thing that he will look out for the first thing that you will look out for when he's handling a criminal case is, lalo na pagsakusado ka, ask ng information. Ask. Huwag ka pupunta sa usgato na hindi mo nabasa information. And for the reason, lawyers handling criminal cases, and the students should also listen to this, should always remember Rule 110, Section 6, which tells us sufficiency of information. So we have to look into, is the name of the accused there? Is the designation of the offense by statute there? Nakalagay ba doon? Yung crime yung ginawa, is it homicide? Is it murder? Whatever it is, is it plunder? It should appear there. The aggravating or qualifying circumstances, including the circumstances surrounding the commission of the offense. You call that cause of accusation. It's very important also, titignan yun as you look at it. Andun ba yung place of commission? Yes, because the place of commission, not necessarily the exact address, will show what? the jurisdiction of the court because venue is jurisdictional in criminal cases. 
And important also is the date, approximate date of commission. Now that we know the sufficiency of information, we would know when the information is defective. Okay? So if the information does not show an offense, the elements are not there. Obviously, the information is defective. What is your remedy against a defective information? Alam niya. Rule 117, it is a motion to quash. Yun ang remedy natin for a defective information. But kindly take note, I highlighted that. Makikita niyo, no? Sa defective information, I also mentioned the motion to quash. Quash, you know why? Because today, you have to be careful on your handling of a motion to quash. Because a motion to quash could be a prohibited motion. Okay? And sasabi mo, sir, wala naman. Attorney, wala naman yan doon sa rules of criminal procedure. Tama. Because it's in the guidelines on continuous trial issued by the Supreme Court. It is in the guidelines of continuous trial. And what does it say? It says exactly, if the motion to quash does not indicate the grounds provided for under Rule 117, Section 3, if I'm not mistaken, hindi ginamit yung mga grounds doon na nasa batas, prohibited pleading yan. That could be denied. The, the court would not even entertain it. However, it doesn't mean that we are prohibited completely from filing a motion to quash. Bawal ba yun? Hindi. For as long as you follow this standard, it is still considered as a meritorious motion. Ano ito? Okay? I'll give you a number of them. Lack of jurisdiction over the person of the accused, lack of jurisdiction over the offense, prescription, double jeopardy, okay? Uh, not compliant with the prescribed form. These are examples of grounds that will be entertained by the court. So that is a meritorious motion. I'll take note of that. And last point on this matter in relation to that, to that including motion to quash. Kindly take note that a motion to quash can only be filed at any time as a general rule before plea. But there are certain instances that you could still file a motion to quash even after plea. Tandaan nyo yan. Ang abogado o estudyante lagi natatandaan yung plea, plea. Okay? After plea, you could still file if it is defective information. Second, lack of jurisdiction over the subject matter or meaning over the offense. Third, prescription. Fourth, double jeopardy. Please take note of those because those are instances where you could still file a motion to quash even after a plea. Let us now touch on another topic. I hope you're still with me and I hope I'm not so fast you know, huh? because we will have to manage time. I would really want to cover as much as we can. You know, I'll give you next slide, but I will still discuss prescription. You know, lately, there was a lot of... Uh, is I will say it, about prescription. There was this uh, recent case decision of the court where there is an issue of prescription. Well, I do not intend to discuss the periods to prescribe, like for purposes of libel or for purposes of cyber libel. I will not discuss that. What is important for us this afternoon, for those who are interested in the study of criminal procedure, is when is the prescriptive period interrupted? Okay? Pag ako nagtuturo sa mga estudyante ko, tatlo lamang ang sinasabi kong tatandaan ninyo. And please remember this until you take the bar exams. Now, for those offenses under the revised penal code, alam natin yan. Ano yun? Homicide, arson, libel, uh, simulation of birth, bigamy, seduction, lahat yan. And yan. Sedition, okay, abduction, mga ganyan, rebellion, lahat yan. What is the, how is the prescriptive period interrupted? Okay. How is the prescriptive period interrupted? Is it filing of the case with the office of the prosecutor or filing it in court? It is interrupted according to the case of Brilliante. Okay? From the time of the filing of the information in the office of the prosecutor. I will repeat, in the office of the prosecutor. Don't put to me tigil ang pagtakbo ng prescriptive period. Maliwana, revise to me now. Now, how about special laws? When will the prescriptive period be interrupted? Now, some of you might say, Oh, Act 3326, yeah, it's from the time of the filing of the uh, action in court. Wait. That has been settled by the court in the case of Panagito and subsequent cases. And don't be confused with that case to that of Saldivia. Paliliwanag ko sa inyo yan because there is a third category. For now, remember, for special laws, this was settled in the case of Panagiton. For, and in the case of Panagiton, 
the factual antecedents pertain to BP-22. Okay, BP-22 yun, ha? Ano sabi ng Supreme Court there? The, in, the, the prescriptive period is interrupted from the filing of the complaint where? Affidavit complaint in the office of the prosecutor. Not in court. And they further discuss, how about violation of the Revised Securities Act? And you filed it in the Securities and Exchange Commission. And the Securities and Exchange Commission conducted preliminary investigation. Is it interrupted? The answer is yes. How about you file it in the office of the Ombudsman? Is it interrupted? According to the case of Kadagipan, yes, it is interrupted. So, maliwanik tayo, special. However, there is this case of Jade Well. This is a case, okay, this is a summary procedure case in Baguio. Alam niyo yun, sa nabasa niyo itong kaso nito, ito'y kinlamp yung gulong. Usong-uso yan, makikita niyo, sana hindi pa naklamp ang gulong niyo para hindi kayo makatakbo, no ha? Yun ang nangyari, okay? But I don't intend to discuss in detail the facts of this case. What you have to remember is that that was a violation of the ordinance. And because it's a violation of the ordinance, it falls under the rules on summary procedure. And by express declaration of the court in relation to the rule on summary procedure, the prescriptive period is interrupted not by reason of the filing of the complaint in the office of the prosecutor, but by reason of the filing of the information in court. I will repeat, by reason of the filing of the information in court, now, sasabihin mo sa akin, is yung nag-contact ng PIB, meron talagang ganun. May ganun ho. Katulad ng BP-22 in Cavite, walang may mga lugar sa Cavite, hindi nag-PPI yan. Pero meron in Metro Manila, there are some areas here where they still conduct preliminary investigation for BP-22. But, the but that's different. BP-22 pertains to special law, interruptive na yun. But when you talk of ordinances, hindi ba natin kaya, ordinances, it is only filed where? It is only interrupted when it is filed in court, okay, maliwanag yan, in relation to the rule on summary procedure. If you're in interested in that, for students listening, you could read the case of Jadewell. Let us now move on to another topic. We will discuss filing fees. Ayan naman. Mainit na usapin po ito pagdating sa filing fees. Dahil alam na alam natin, pagdating sa filing fees, sa civil po ah, civil muna. When we talk of civil cases, file, payment of filing fees is Ju jurisdictional. Alam po natin. But do we follow the same rule in criminal cases? Kindly make reference to Rule 111, Section 1 that tell us that for actual damages, may ginawa kang krimen sa akin at dahil doon ako na-hospital, nawalan ako ng mga gamit, those are actual damages. Should there be filing fees for my instituting the action? The answer is no. Finally, they not. However, if I claim moral, exemplary, nominal, and temperate damages, do I need to pay filing fees? The answer is yes. However, yung mga nanonood dito na partisado, sasabihin lang, eh wala naman kami nakikita sa information eh. Madalang na madalang ka makita ng information na may damages. Okay? O, paano yun? According to the rule 111 section 1, should it later be proven that there is moral, exemplary, nominal, temperate, damages, in the courts of the trial, it will be a first lien on the judgment. So pag sinabi ng court, napatunayan sa trial na may moral, exemplary, patuna, ano ka? Bayad ka, it's a, it's a lien on the judgment. Now, maaaring may nakikinig rin na abogado ngayon, sabi niya, kamisado niya yung BP-22. Atorni, ibang BP-22, which is true. Because for BP-22, you are to pay filing fees for actual damages. Yan ang exception dyan. So, it is based on the phase of the check value of the check. And if you claim moral, exemplary, nominal, temperate, and even, even liquidated damages, are you to pay filing fees? Yes, you are. So kaya yung mga may experience sa inyo sa BP-22, alam na alam niya. Kailangan magbayad tayo. And there, is, there could have been another uh, discussion on uh, how to pay it, but that might waste or eat up most of our time. But please take note of that filing fees. No? Clearly, or regular, or uh, the rest of the offenses, and then in relation to or distinguished to BP-22 cases. Now, let us now move on to another topic. Okay? Let us now look at death. Okay? Death of an accused in a criminal case. Namatayan na ba kayo ng kliyente? Ako, namatayan na ako ng kliyente two decades ago. So what will I do? Always remember this. And for those who will take the bar, please remember this. If the accused dies after a plea. Okay. If the accused has entered a plea and he died, 
the criminal case will be dismissed. And the civil aspect arising from the delic will likewise be dismissed. Sabi mo, scot free na, oh, oh, can you run against the state? Hindi. Okay. As distinguished, if the accused died before plea. If the accused died before plea, obviously the criminal case would be dismissed. But what happens to the civil aspect? You can proceed against the estate of the accused. Yun ang liliwanagin ko. Again, the reference point, it's very important for us to remember, is the plea. If your client has entered a plea, you have the counsel for the accused, hinga ka na. Siyempre, ayaw mo namang mamatay ang kliyente mo, pero okay, walang criminal liability, definitely, di mo na makikukulong yun, walang civil liability. But if my client dies before plea, before plea, then what happens? The criminal case is dismissed, but they could still proceed against the estate of the deceased client. Now, and I would like you to take note of my next statement. Ano yun? Independent civil actions or arising from other sources of obligation. And please take note of this. Kasi yung akusado, the accused, who died, may have other cases arising, let's say, from defamation, but this action was based on Article 33 of the Civil Code, or physical injuries under Article 33, or maybe negligence under Article 2176, but it could also be a criminal case. Nagkataong yung gumawa nun died. Will those actions survive? Definitely. Definitely. Because that is an independent civil action, or even those arising from other sources of obligation, like contracts, quasi-contracts. Those arising from other sources of obligation will survive. And for this reason, I would like to call your attention to, second, to the second paragraph of Rule 111, Section 4, if I'm not mistaken. You will see there the duty of the lawyer to give notice. But please don't be confused. I think the drafters then, in the year 2000, just wanted to make sure that you're aware of the steps that you will follow. But in fact, even in the absence of that provision, in Rule 111, Section 4, the applicable provision could have been or should be Rule 3, Section 16. To my mind, that could have been superfluous. But objectively, I think the drafters just simply wanted that you are aware that these are the steps that you will have to take for those cases of the accused that would have survived because it's an independent civil action. Or number two, it is what? Arising from other sources of obligation. For all intents and purposes, that is A. Civil case, hindi po siya criminal. Now, let us now move on to another topic. Are we on schedule? Mukhang we're on schedule, no? The, what is your remedy for an acquittal? Okay, sabihin natin, attorney. Yan, alam nyo, meron po ako narinig na isang radio program. Hindi ko na malaman, naalala ko nga. Uh, ah, ito, naalala ko po. Yung kay Napolis. Okay, naalala ko po ito. Let me just share with you on the lighter side. Narinig po sa isang radio program at uh, ang humahawak po nung, nung programa na yun, nag-host po noon, ay hindi po mga ano, may knowledge ng batas, hindi po apitado. So when I was listening to them, lahat po ng konsepto, sabi niya, pwede daw certiorari, pwede daw mag-appeal, ang daming dinidiscuss. Kasi there was, there was this, I think, item, discussion about acquittal. Santabi natin yun po, ha? ang pinag-usapan natin, what is a remedy for an acquittal? Kaya po tayo nagtatalo madalas because we are not familiar with it. That's why I'm sharing this with you. What is your remedy for an acquittal? Ordinarily, what is the rule? Or generally, what is the rule? Pag ako ito, tapos na po. Executory na yun. Pwede ka mag-MR? Tinanong na sa bar exams yun. Hindi. Pwede ka mag-appeal? Hindi. Acquitted na eh. But do you have a remedy if you're the prosecution or you're the offended party? You felt parang mali si judge. Parang mali si judge. Do you have a remedy? Yes. That is a petition for certiorari. Grave abuse of discretion amounting to lack of excess of jurisdiction. Kindly take note that this is an extraordinary remedy. It's not usually okay, a build-off. Hindi po yan. Although nagamit ko na po yan sa ibang pagkakataon, it is not something that parang apin gamitin ko kaya. Because here, there is an additional requirement. Bakit? You will have to obtain the conformity of the office of the Solicitor General. Does it be more why? Why do you need to go to the office of the Solicitor General? According to the case of Javier versus Gonzalez, this is the remedy. Why? Because at the level of the appellate court, it's no longer the prosecutor who is the counsel of the state. It's already the 
solicitor general. That's why you have to get the conformity of that. The offended party will have to get the conformity of the office of the solicitor general. So yung pong remedio, the case of Abier versus Gonzalez, you might want to uh, look at that. Now, let us now move on to another topic, motion to suspend proceedings on the ground of a prejudicial question. Okay? Before I uh, move on to my particular discussion on prejudicial question, let us try to refresh ourselves on what is prejudicial question. Let's try to refresh. A prejudicial question requires, number one, that the civil action has been instituted ahead of the criminal. Opo. Nauna dapat, may naunang civil case. At pangalawa, the resolution of such issue in the civil case is what determines the issue in the criminal action. Or according to some jurisprudence, it says, is determinative of the guilt or innocence of the person. In one case decided by the court, sabi ng isang akusado, sabi niya, May civil case ako na una. I was questioning the interest rate in that BP22. That is a prejudicial question. The Supreme Court said, no, it's not a prejudicial question. Now, the effect of a prejudicial question is that it suspends the person. Ano na suspend? Yung criminal case to allow the civil case to proceed because the issue there will determine the issue in the criminal case. That's why, ang isususpend muna ay ang criminal case. After having said that and having help us refresh the concept of prejudicial question. Is filing a motion to suspend on the ground of a prejudicial question a prohibited debate? Yan. Prohibited ba yan? Pinagbabawal ba yan? Please take note of this because this was mentioned under the guidelines on continuous trial. It is a prohibited pleading if you, the motion to suspend that you file on the ground of prejudicial question does not want, does not present a situation wherein the civil has already been filed ahead of the criminal. So, kailangan pakita mo na unang civil, may pending civil case, for you to suspend your criminal case on the ground of a prejudicial question. Although, I'll tell you, marami sa inyo na practitioner, maaari makipag-argue sa akin, sabi mo, may naipanalo ako, civil-civil, akin to. Meron ako na penalo, criminal, administrative, akin to prejudicial question. But I tell you, under the guidelines of continuous trial passed by the Supreme Court, if the civil is not instituted ahead of the criminal, that is a prohibited duty. That gives the court the license to deny outright your motion because it is a non-meritorious motion. Okay? Please take note. Kaya ko po yun binanggit. Now, let us now proceed to another discussion point. Nakikita niyo po sa outline natin. The next discussion point is a motion for reinvestigation. Now, I will address this statement to the students. Even if you look at the provisions of the rules of criminal procedure, you will not find motion for reinvestigation. You will not even find a definition of a motion for reinvestigation. But of course, practitioners listening to us will say, alam ko yan, sa totoo po, nalaman ko rin yan ng practitioner natin. But let me give you how or for what reason a motion for investigation is filed. Kadalasan po, ginagamit yan ang abogado ganito. Talo ka sa Office of the Prosecutor. Dahil talo ka, papalo ang information o sa salitang lingwahe ng uh, layman, sisipa yung information sa usgado. Pagpunta po doon, ang susunod na mangyayari dyan would be possibly out the issuance of a warrant of arrest within 10 days from determination of probable cause and arraignment. Yan po ang susunod na mangyayari. But of course, a more seasoned lawyer, what he will do is to file an MR. He will file an MR in the Office of the Prosecutor knowing that it will not prevent the uh, forwarding of the records with the court. But what he will do is immediately file a motion for investigation there, requesting the court, please grant this because I have a pending MR in the Office of the Prosecutor. Please return the entire records to the court. And in a number of instances, the court grants it if it's meritorious. And in some instances also, lawyers have abused this remedy. That is why it is now a prohibited pleading if you did not seek leave of court. Kung lihitin mo naman yung investigation mo, bakit hindi? But if you did not seek leave of court, number one, when a preliminary investigation is not required, you are insisting on a preliminary investigation, meaning the offense for which your client is charged is below four years, two months, and one day, then you're asking for investigation. That's not, the court will not allow it. That's a prohibited motion. And number three, 
Some lawyers are just very creative. And I've seen this even after the effectivity of this guidelines and continuous trial. They totally disregard the guidelines. File sila. Motion for investigation. Credibility, admissibility. They went into the evidence. Quantum. And according to these guidelines, can be. The court can what? Deny that outright. So a motion for investigation for those reasons without leave of court will be an unmerited motion. Okay, another. Let's move on to another topic. So alam na po yun, ano? Sa mga estudyante, that's additional knowledge also because that's covered by the bar exams. Now, motion for preliminary investigation. Ang tanong mo, sir, pareho lang yun ah. Parang pareho talaga. But I tell you, motion for investigation was already asked in the bar exams before. Motion asking for preliminary investigation was already asked in the bar exams. So you have to know. What, when is it a prohibited pleading? Motion for preliminary investigation. Number one, as you know, when there is what? An inquest and a person is arrested, information is filed, then the accused learns that an information is filed while he's detained. Can he ask for preliminary investigation during that five years from uh, that five years, five days from knowledge of the filing of the information? Yes. And please take note, you are to file your motion for preliminary investigation within five days from knowledge. Beyond that five days from knowledge, that is a prohibited thing. Kasi ang abogado ngayon, again, with all due respect, meron kasi creative, isang buwan na motion for preliminary investigation. Dalawang buwan na motion for preliminary investigation. Limang araw lang. Okay? Now, another instance that you cannot, that shows that you cannot file a motion for, for preliminary investigation is when a preliminary investigation is not required. Is that required? You're asking for preliminary investigation. Or number two, there is a preliminary investigation but you did not participate. You decide, I don't want to participate. Despite you notice, therefore, there is no good reason for the court to allow you to have a preliminary investigation. I will just give you an additional remedy for uh, practitioners or uh, would-be pra practitioners law students or listening to us. Ang gagawin nyo, pag nasara na yung PI, hindi mo alam eh. Hindi mo alam. In fact, your client learned of it and you were given the subpoena after the uh, termination of all the preliminary investigation. You didn't know. So when you arrived in the office of the prosecutor, you checked on the case, ano po nangyari? Uh, ito pong kaso, ay tapos na, sasabihin na tapos na. Submitted for resolution na yan. Sasabihin, submitted for resolution. Ah, ganun po ba? Oh, wala na yan. Akit na sa taas yan eh. May resolution na yan eh. Sasabihin nilang ganun. What is your remedy? Immediately file a motion to reopen. To stop them from taking action and to elevate it. Again, that's not in the, that's not in the provision of the that's brought about by practice. The next one, service of subpoena. I need to touch on this. Look at my outline. May kita niyo po, no? Service of subpoena on respondents. You see that? Service of subpoena on respondents. Sabi mo, importante ba yan? Eh, talaga naman sa-serve ng subpoena eh. For me, this is very important. And I would like to give time discussing this. Service of uh, subpoena to respondents. You know why? Some lawyers give this advice, again, with all due respect. Sasabihin nun, tatawag kliyente. Sasabihin, attorney, meron dito naghahanap sa akin. Parang may supina ako eh. Meron daw akong criminal case sa Pasay. Doon. May criminal case daw ako dyan sa, ano, eh, sa Pasay. Tanggapin ko ba? Ayan ang tanong. Will I receive it, attorney? What should be your advice? Dapat ang advice mo. Tanggapin mo. You know why? A supina is not the same as a summon. Summons is in Rule 14. If we talk of summons, that is proper service of summons is necessary for the court to acquire jurisdiction over the person of the defendant. Maliwanag yun. But in criminal cases, I would like to call your attention. This would be very helpful, especially for practitioners. Rule 112, Section 3, Subsection D. If the respondent cannot be subpoenaed, okay? If the respondent cannot be subpoenaed, so kahit hindi ka masupina, or if subpoena, you didn't file your counter affidavit within the period of 10 days, the case will be submitted for resolution. Hindi ka hihintayin ng kalaban mo. Hindi ka hihintayin ng piskal. That's what I'm trying to share with you. Hindi ka hihintayin niya. Kung ako kalaban mo, ako, ako I'm the counsel of the offended party, mas gusto ko. Taguan mo yung subpoena na yun. In fact, there is this, uh, I've, learned, I've heard of this uh, practice of some unscrupulous 
uh, clerk or court personnel na sana hindi na ginagawa. This was decades ago. Ang ginagawa nila, sinasadya nilang mali ang address. Because if the address is wrong, wrong by one number, obviously the respondent will not be able to receive it. So what the prosecutor will do is to send it once, send it twice, even if he send, he will send it thrice, that respondent will not receive it. And then the court, the prosecutor will say, eh, wala naman palang interest ko. He's not interested in this case. Okay, submitted for resolution. So be very careful with this. Again, a subpoena is not a song. Therefore, the effects will not be the same. In fact, there is no substituted service here. Okay? Now, let us now proceed with an inquest. I hope I was, I'm not as fast, you know? I hope I'm not as fast, but uh, uh, there is a fiber. Okay? I hope that uh, my, my, my line is very clear. Let me just check. You know? Baka mamaya, salita ako ng salita, naputol po ako. I'm okay. So far, I'm okay. So let us now touch on inquest. This is a very interesting topic for students. And for lawyer, this is a very stressful situation. Again, for law students, this is an exciting discussion because inquest is always a discussion in relation with Rule 113, Section 5, arrest without a warrant. That's very interesting for a law student. But for lawyers, like myself, that is a stressful situation. Why? Because your client has been arrested. Ganun nyo, tatawag sa'yo, yung kliyente mo or yung, yung pamilya ng kliyente mo. Sabi na, Torni, nangyari, alam ko na yan, nangyari yan. Tinawagan ako, sabi yung, yung anak ko, attorney na nahuli. Sabi ko, nasan? Because under the rules, a person arrested without a warrant, what does Rule 113, Section 5 says? Say, it says that a person is caught about to commit, committing, or has just committed in his presence of the law enforcement officer or a citizen who is affecting the arrest. Or number two, the crime has just been committed, meaning hot pursuit, and based on facts and circumstances, there is reasonable ground to believe based on probable cause that the person to be arrested or who has just committed it is in fact the person who committed it. So arrest him. At itong mga taong ito ay dadalhin sa nearest police station, sa pinakamalapit na police station. So yun na nga, nakatanggap ako ng tao. Lator, hindi nasa police station yung anak ko. Sabi ko, where? Saan? Punta. Okay, punta ako. Is what happens there? Of course, the arrest will be booked. That's not yet the inquest. The arrest will be booked. The arresting officer will uh, prepare a statement, subscribe under oath, and all of these papers will be prepared and then will be forwarded pagsakay sa city yan sa Hall of Justice yan, dyan mga prosecutors. Together with the detained person or the arrestee, he will be brought in front of the inquest prosecutor. And kindly take note, they will have to comply with Article 125 that even for the gravest of offenses within 36 hours, a criminal, the same, the same should, they should have been brought to the nearest judicial authority. So yan, the prosecutor will examine the records. He will examine the records. And if the prosecutor sees strong evidence, it seems that he really committed it, probable cause. What will the prosecutor say? Detain, detain mo yan. That person arrestee will be brought back to the police station. And then the prosecutor, inquest prosecutor, will process his recommendation to his boss. And if he says detained, then the information will be prepared and found. The second, if the prosecutor says, Uy, mahina ito. Parang walang basihan. There is, it's, there, it seems that there's no basis for this arrest. It doesn't fall under Rule 113, Section 5. What will the prosecutor do? The prosecutor will release, not dismiss. He will, okay, release mo yan. But it doesn't mean you don't have a case. You still have a case. Why? Because there is a complainant, the arresting officer. And all of those records will now be filed in the office of the prosecutor as if it was an ordinary criminal complaint or affidavit. You know, that's the process. Now, having said that, you have a number of options. Okay? You have a number of options. What is this? What are your options? Your client has already been detained. And sabi, oh, detain mo yan, malakas yung kaso. What should uh, you do? You have a number of options. You could ask for preliminary investigation. Waive Article 125 of the Revised Penal Code. The Q, uh, the respondent, waive ko po yan. Gusto ko mag-PI. But as a lawyer, I will not do that. Why? Because preliminary investigation may take some time. And I cannot assure my client that this, this will be expeditious. 
that this will be done in two weeks, in a week, or in a month. I'm not too sure. So what I will do, what I will do, is to wait until the information is valid for. In fact, ako nga yung magpa-follow up, babantayan ko. Asa, nasa court na ba yan? Once it's in court, what will I do? I learned of the same, I'll file a preliminary investigation, I also file, apply for bail for my client. So my client could go home, and at the same time, I could ask for preliminary investigation, it stops somehow the proceedings in court, PI tayo rito, for as long as it's within five days. So that the court may grant it and return the records for preliminary investigation in the office of the prosecutor. Now, you will ask me, attorney, saan ba yung ano, definition na binibigay mo? Actually, if you look at Rule one, rule 112, Section 6, you will not find the definition that explains it. You will find this in jurisprudence, okay? Because if you read the provision in Section 6, it says, but no definition. It will show an inquest is conducted in accordance with the rules. And this is in accordance with the rules of the Department of Justice. Okay, yun po yun. Let us now proceed with the next one. Judicial determination of probable cause. Po, ah? Puno, puno tayo. Judicial determination of probable cause. This is another interesting topic. You know, for practitioners, there is what you call executive determination at the level of the prosecutor. Now, there is what you call judicial determination. And when will this happen? It happens within the period of time that the information is filed in the office of the, not in the office of the prosecutor, is filed in court, information. And based on rule 112, section 5, it is the duty of the judge to personally examine the records and to determine if there exists probable cause within a period of 10 days. And within the period of 10 days, if he's convinced that there is probable cause, he issues a warrant of arrest. And once he issues a warrant of arrest per jurisprudence, there's already determination of probable cause. Pero bakit ko ba, eh, ito ni simple na alam ko na yan. Bakit mo binanggit yan? Because today, if you file a motion for determination of probable cause, judicial determination of probable cause, is what? A prohibited pleading. Bakit? Kindly take note that a motion of that nature is not even found under the rules of criminal procedure. But you know how lawyers are. Lawyers are creative within the legal realm. Ganyan ang abogato creative. So, nung pumasok yung konsepto niya, what lawyers did was to file in, before the issue once of a warrant, a diligent lawyer will wait until the information is filed. Alam niya, talo ang kliyente ko sa fiscal niya. Abangan niya yung doon. Once the information is filed, immediately he will file a motion for determination of probable cause. And that would stop the judge from issuing the warrant of arrest. Unless, of course, the judge did, throws that away. But most of the time, the judge, if there is a motion, okay, sige, mag-comment muna kayo. Mag-away, ay, bak magsagutan pa kayo doon. So, that delays the proceedings. And the Supreme Court realized and noticed that. That is why now, it is a prohibited thing. You cannot stop it. You cannot even stop the issuance of the warrant of arrest today. The very moment, in fact, the filing of a motion to quash, this is in relation to the Delima case, Senator Delima case, will not stop the issuance of the warrant of arrest. So, do not fault the judge for issuing, do not fault, please do not fault the judge for issuing the warrant of arrest. Because that is her, her duty, or his or her duty, under Rule 112, Section 5. You cannot stop the judge from issuing the warrant of arrest by warrant of arrest by just filing a motion to quash. No, if you want to stop it, you 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 lift the you lift the warrant of arrest. Or better yet, even before it reaches the court, you should have you have you should have questioned the jurisdiction of the uh, Department of Justice in conducting the preliminary investigation. Okay, now let us now proceed with the next topic. Dito po tayo sa next topic natin. Our next topic is uh, bail. Okay, bail as a matter of right. Now, this is very interesting. For those of you studying the law, this is very interesting. I'll be discussing section four, section five, section six, seven, and eight of Rule 114 on bail. But of course, sa mga practitioners natin na praktisado, alam na alam nila to. Let me start with bail as a matter of right. When is bail as a matter of right for students listening in this, uh, in my present lecture? Bail is a matter of right for those cases falling within the jurisdiction of the municipal trial court or metropolitan trial court before or after conviction. Ang mga, mga practitioner, alam nila yan. Sabihin lang, pag MPC, don't worry. 
we could apply for bail. Because it's a matter of right before or after conviction for as long as it's not yet executed. Now, how about RTC? Can it be a matter of right? Yes. If the penalty for the offense is not death, life reclusion perpetual. But before conviction. Okay, I'll give you an example, a classic example, a book example, the case of Leviste, wherein the former governor Leviste, who was charged or alleged to have uh, uh, shot his aide, surrendered before the office of the prosecutor, surrendered, and was initially charged with homicide. Homicide po ang demanda sa kanya. And because it's homicide, anya, because it's homicide, he was able to apply for bail as a matter of that. But again, of course, that was questioned, and the DOJ reversed it. It became murder. That is why he had to apply for a petition for bail. That would come in later on, so later as a discussion. So for now, that's bail as a matter of right. And kindly take note of this, though. No? Let me share this with you. There are jurisprudence that says all applications for bail should have a hearing. Again, with all due respect, if it's bail as a matter of right, some judges, except for extraordinary situations, or unless there is an application for reduction of bail or increase in bail, the judge will just allow you to process your bail because it's a matter of right. Okay, second, when is bail, yan po tayo, next topic natin, when is bail a matter of discretion? And I am now referring to Section 5 of Rule 104. Yeah, nah? 104, not 104, 114 of, of uh, Section 5 of Rule 114. Bail is a matter of discretion. Bail is a matter of discretion, and this is clear in the provision of the law, after conviction in the regional trial court if the penalty is not death, life reclusion perpetua. Take right? note. Let's carve out, sabi natin yung death life reclusion perpetua, you are convicted, your client is convicted, RTC, estafa, malversation, uh, libel, kung ano yan, okay, convicted yon, siya, matter of discretion, can he apply for bail? That is already a matter of discretion. And kindly, students, listen to this. At that point in time, there is a provision in the rule that says, the accused can continue based on his original bail during the pendency of the appeal. That's clear in the provision. However, there is that second paragraph of that section 5. What does it say? It says that if one of the conditions in the second paragraph is present or the penalty imposed is exceeding six years, sabi daw, is exceeding six years, ano yun? then bail is a matter of discretion. Can you take note? What are those instances? Number one, flight risk. Number two, he evaded what? Arrest. Flight risk, evaded arrest, recidivist, quasi-recidivist, habitual delinquent, ano pa? violated parole uh, or uh, probation. All of those, why he, just even one of those is present, ano mangyayari dyan? Just one of those is present, it will result to bail as a matter of discussion. Meaning, okay, this is the rule. The first, your client is convicted. None of those circumstances that I've mentioned is present. The court may exercise discretion, clearly. But the very moment one of those conditions is present, one of those conditions is present, what happens? The court will not exercise discretion. Kahit ano pa pa. The court will not exercise discretion. That's the case of Levisto. Now, let me give you an example so that you will be able to Remember this. Para po. Meron nga akong actual na kaso kasi nangyari na po yan. Yung kalaban po, ang kaso is tafa. Private prosecutor ko ako. Private, I'm a private prosecutor. And it was already scheduled for promulgation of judgment. And my opponent, the counsel of the accused, decided to waive the reading of the entire text of the decision and just read the dispositive portion of the decision. Maybe he feels uh, my client may be convicted, but I will just apply for it or apply that my original bail continue as to my accused. So what he did was, it was read, and his client was convicted for four counts of his law firm. And, and uh, immediately he said, uh, Your Honor, may I request that my client continue with his original bail? What did I say? Your Honor, uh, I would like to oppose that application because at this point in time, it's already a matter of discretion, and his client is a flight risk. And why do I say his client is a flight risk? It took us three years 
to get him arrested before we proceeded with the case. So his client has really been a, a problem for us. So what did the court do? The court did not allow him to be there. And we had hearings to determine whether or not he's a flight risk. And at the end of the day, the court decided that he was a flight risk. So during the pendency of his appeal, he was already one. He was already there in, in, in uh, incarcerated in jail. Sandali lang po, hindi ko alam. I hope that I am still okay, ha? Wala naman nagme-message sa akin. I hope. Um, let me just sandali lang. I'm okay. I thought my signal is in, uh, being interrupted. Now, let us now proceed to the next discussion point. Bail as a matter of what? Bail as uh, non-bailable. I would want to be very clear. Non-bailable is my next topic. What about non-bailable? Ito po yon. Pagpasensya nyo nyo ako pag tumitingan ako ng ganon because I'm looking at the watch. I'm very conscious of our time because I would want to finish this on time. Now, non-bailable offenses. Ano yun? Sabi mo, attorney. Well, especially if uh, you're talking to a constitutionalist, he will say, kung hindi naman pwede yan, non-bailable. Under the Constitution, every accused is entitled to bail. But in the same Constitution that we're discussing, if the evidence of guilt is strong in certain offenses, you're not automatically entitled to bail. That is why for criminal procedure, uh, professors like us, we tag it as non-bailable. Bibigyan ko kayo ng example. Yung mga sikat na mga, sikat na mga public officer na may mga demand ng plan I won't mention names. Or those who have been sued for murder, for rape, for illegal, uh, uh, for illegal uh, detention, serious illegal detention. Ano po yan? Non-bailable po yan. Anong ibig sabihin nun? Pag, uh, once the information is filed, once the information is filed, the court issues a warrant of arrest, what happens? You will be detained. Ganun mo yan. The person will be detained, even if you want to pass, even if you want to apply for bail. You will, be you will be arrested and you will be detained. Now, your lawyer, and that is our function, that is our duty, the lawyers, will have to file a petition for bail. Yan po yung tatandaan nyo. A petition for bail. And that's not automatic. That will be heard. But the beauty of this today is ito. Once there is a hearing, the first hearing for the petition for bail, okay, the first hearing for the petition for bail, within 30 days, the court will have to resolve the same. And based on the same guidelines on continuous trial, it is only the duty of the prosecution to show that the evidence of guilt is strong. The accused is not even required to present evidence. And even filing of memorandum could be dispensed with. And what is the reason for this? In order to give the accused that swift remedy on his petition for bail. But kindly take note my next, of my next, next statement. My next statement is a statement that has been asked in the bar exams. Can you apply for bail before an accused is arraigned. Can an accused apply for bail before arraignment? The answer is no. The accused should first be arraigned and subjected to pretrial under the guidelines. Because under the case of Serapio, this is Serapio versus Antigua Bio, that is not a requirement. But under the guidelines, I know where the uh, drafters were when they placed this under the guidelines. They were of the mindset that we have to take on and have a, a complete grasp of that youth, so that whatever he does, we could continue with the case in absentia. So that is why now, under the guidelines of pre-trial, under the guidelines of pre-trial, under the guidelines, not on pre-trial, guidelines on speedy trial or continuous trial, the accused should have been arraigned. Okay? Now, let us now discuss a few more items of bail. Dapat na pa ako mag-break? Ah, hindi pa. I have a few more minutes. Where to apply for bail? Am I on schedule? I am on schedule. Next slide tayo. Where to apply for bail? This is very interesting. Recently, I received a query on this, of this nature. So, But for us to fully understand where to apply for bail, it's very important for us to create a number of scenarios. This is provided for in Rule 114, Section 17, if I'm not mistaken, give or take one section. I'll pay to use the scenario without referring exactly to the technical provision of the rules. Let us look at this scenario. The accused has a case in Pampanga, okay? He has a case in Pampanga, but he was arrested also in Pampanga, okay? Where can he apply for bail? He could apply for bail, number one, in the court where the action is pending, meaning in his branch where the action is pending. 
Number two, can he go elsewhere? Because I know that for some practitioners, you've heard of some people, pedling, oh, kahit saan gusto mag-apply ng bail, pwede. You have to apply for bail if you are arrested in Pampanga, where your action is pending. Take note, arrested in Pampanga, where your action is pending. You could apply for bail number one before the court where the action is pending. Now, if your judge is absent or unavailable, and this should be supported by a certification, only then could you go to any RPC or MTC of Pampanga. Ganun po yun, ha? That's one. That's the first scenario. Now, the next scenario is this. At ito, marami may problema nito. The case is in Pampanga, but you are here for a resident of Quezon City. Okay? If you were arrested in Quezon City, where can you apply for bail under the provision? You could apply for bail there, or you have an option of applying where? Before any RTC of Quezon City, or in the absence of the RTC judges, before any MTC, which is very rare naman nangyari. Laging present yung mga judges niya. Ganun po yun. But the next question is this, the tricky part, and I know some lawyers have had situations of this. Eh, ayaw ng kliyente ko eh. Okay? Ayaw ng kliyente ko eh. And I will tell you this, we could talk about this over coffee, but for purposes of this discussion, your client will have to be arrested. <laughs> if your client is not arrested, it gets you. if your client is not arrested, he cannot apply for bail anywhere else. He should go there. He should be going there. Then the next one, what if bail is a matter of discretion, the one that I discussed a while ago, or your client that you would like to apply for recognizance. You could only apply for that in the court where the action is pending. Okay? And the next one, uh, you have a relative or a friend who went to, let's say, Subic, okay, and uh, had fun and was arrested, where could you apply for bail? The arresto, no case at all. Well, naturally, venue is jurisdictional. That, that It was there where the crime was committed. He was in a bar, had, uh, had a fight with someone. He's arrested, brought to the nearest police station. What happened? He could apply for bail, of course, in the province, city, or municipality. But naturally, there should be a pending case already. There will be a case filed against you. So let us have a break. It's already 3.30. I will have a quick break. And then we will proceed.
we're back. Thank you for your uh, patience. We just have to make a uh, short gap. Then we will continue now with our discussion. The next topic that I will discuss will be when bail not required, okay, or a reduced bail. When is it not required? And I think most of the practitioners listening right now or watching at this very moment would know what I mean. And for students, this is a situation wherein the accused has provisionally detained has served the maximum, has served the maximum of his penalty equal to or more than the maximum. So in that case, what should the court do? The court should immediately release that accused without prejudice to the continuation of the case. Just to give you an example, I've had a, a, a number of years ago, it was not my case, I was just waiting for my turn. And then this uh, the judge was uh, jokingly telling the accused, oh, how long have you been in, uh, in jail? In, how long have you been de detained? As uh, Your Honor, I've been uh, nandun na po ako ng mga ano, isang po. Oh, yeah, what's your, what's your charge? Uh, bagan siya po. Oh, that's too much, the judge said. And, and then the, the judge knew that there was no reason to detain the person longer. So what did the judge do? A public attorney, you, you, you take action. So the court immediately released him without prejudice to the continuation of the case. It doesn't mean that the case will be dismissed. But again, based on experience, that case will eventually be dismissed because that would not have lasted so long if the prosecution had witnesses to prove it. Eventually, that will be dismissed, okay, for failure to prosecute. Second, it's also possible that the accused must have has served uh, equal to or more than the minimum penalty without considering the indeterminate sentence law. What can the court do? The court can require or allow a reduced bail or that he be what? Okay? He could be allowed on a reduced bail or on a recognizance. Those are the situations okay, that we have to remember. My next discussion point based on our uh, outline is cross-examination. Now, you will tell me, attorney, why are we now touching on cross-examination? This is a concept in evidence. No, under Rule 115, one of the rights of the accused is his right to confront the witnesses by conducting cross-examination. And this will be very brief in the light of the amendment of Rule 132 so that hindi na kayo makikipag-away sa usnado. Under the present amendment, we are now following strictly the English rule, not the American rule. And what do I mean by the English rule? You have sufficient freedom, right? sufficient fullness and freedom to test the honesty and truthfulness and freedom of bi from bias of that witness. So, ibig sabihin yan, okay, that your opponent cannot say this. Oh, your honor, the questions of this cross-examiner were not covered in the direct examination. That's no longer allowed. Because that line... Under Rule 132, if I'm not mistaken, Section 5 or Section 5 of cross-examination has already been deleted, okay? That your cross-examination is only limited to the scope or the matters taken up on direct. That's no longer the rule. The present rule is the English rule or the wide open rule. Para na kayo mag-aari sa usigado pag nagkaharap-harap kayo. Now, let us now move on to another topic. Form of testimony. This is another very interesting uh, topic, form of testimony, at the first level courts. And my discussion was taken not under the rules of criminal procedure, but under the guidelines on continuous trial that was passed by the Supreme Court. And it's a, it's a very good uh, provision. Let's look at this. So MTC, Municipal Trial Court, Metropolitan Trial Court, in criminal cases, I'll, I'm just touching on criminal cases, in criminal cases, you could use, the prosecution now can use the uh, subscribed written statements of witnesses of the affected party given before law enforcement officers. Second, they could also use what? The affidavit submitted before the office of the prosecutor. You will ask, so, attorney, hindi na kailangan judicial affidavit. If those that I said, the sworn statement, and the affidavit, counter affidavit, where in the office of the prosecutor are not available, then the parties can file their judicial affidavit. And just to give you some sort of a history, to my mind, the real reason here 
is not to overburden our prosecutors. Because I recall early on when the judicial judicial affidavit rule was rolled out, the prosecutors wrote a very strong letter. They said that this is too much of a burden for us to do all of this. And they were really saying, we could use the statements made by the offended party. We could use the affidavits during preliminary investigation. And true enough, that was considered by the Supreme Court. Okay? And only if not available, you could use a judicial affidavit. And now, whether it is criminal, as I'm discussing right now, or civil, whether it is civil or criminal, judicial affidavit okay, is allowed. But again, this is subject to cross-examination. My discussion here pertains to direct examination. So in lieu of direct examination, these are the items that will be submitted. Sworn statement, affidavits during preliminary investigation, or judicial affidavit. Subject to additional direct examination in court, and of course, subject to cross-examination. Let us now move on to the next topic. The MTC or RTC, ha? Punta naman tayo sa susunod. The next topic would be form of testimony in the RTC, Sandigan Bayan, or Court of Tax Appeals. And please take note of this. Please take note of this. Uh, as you know, under the judicial affidavit rule, if the penalty of the, for the offense exceeds six years, and naturally that falls within the regional trial court, jurisdiction of the, of the regional trial court, a judicial affidavit may only be allowed if it is with the consent of the accused. Baliwanag yan. That's very clear under the judicial affidavit rule. However, you will have to supplement it with the guidelines of continuous trial. You will have to supplement it. Why? Because under the guidelines of continuous trial, if the witnesses to be presented will only touch on documentary matters, okay, and demeanor is not essential, like experts, engineers, auditors, investigators, medical legal officers, judicial affidavits, may be or can be accepted even at the level of the RTC, Court of Appeals, or Court of Tax Appeals. In fact, just to share with you, I had this case. Of course, I had this case with the Sardinian Bayan, and I don't want the prosecution to have an easy time. I would want them to present their, uh, all of their witnesses in open court and to see it on the stand. But I recall, because of time, this uh, guidelines continuous trial took effect. So sabi sa akin ng justice, sabi ako, judicial affidavit na tayo, I had no choice. Because if the case is transactional in nature, like malversation, estafa, or falsification, you don't need, and demeanor is not important, judicial affidavit may be accepted by this court. However, if we are looking at the culpability of the accused based on demeanor of witnesses, just like eyewitnesses, the direct examination should be oral in nature, and the witness will have to be presented on direct examination. Now, again, for instances where in uh, for instances where in demeanor is not uh, necessary to be observed by the court, we follow the same rule: sworn statement of uh, witnesses submitted before law enforcement officers, affidavits, counter affidavits before the office of the prosecutor or the ombudsman. In the absence of the same, you submit judicial affidavit. Okay. Now let us now proceed to our next. Topic. This is very interesting. Another very interesting topic. What is this? Plea bargaining in drugs cases. And we know there's so many drugs cases nowadays, and, uh, and then a lot of us lawyers are prosecuting or even defending uh, accused related to, to cases involving drugs. Now, kindly take note that plea bargaining is allowed. That is plea of guilt to a lesser offense. For example, you're charged of murder, I'll plead homicide. I'm charged of robbery, I'll plead theft. Okay? But kindly take note that as a general rule, before the jurisprudence on the matter, plea bargaining was not allowed. It was not allowed for drugs cases by express provision of the dangerous drugs. Look, hindi po allowed yet. However, in the light of the Estepona ruling that now allows plea of guilt, to a lesser offense or what you call plea bargaining in drugs cases, ayan, naglabas ang Department of Justice. Circular number, Department of Justice Circular number 061 on November 21, 2017. I don't intend to discuss everything. I'll just give you an idea so that you could source this out when you need this. And this is sharing with the practitioners and for, for law students as well. Number one, the person was 
apprehended or caught selling. Okay? Nagtutulak, pushing of drugs. Nagtutulak. Can he be a, can there be a plea of guilt to a lesser offense? Yes. Possession of dangerous drugs under Section 11. So from Section 5, plea of guilt to Section 11. Baka may nagre-react sa inyo. Hindi pwede siyempre yung malaki ang bentahan dito. When you talk of drugs, it's only limited here to shabu, which is less than 5 grams, and marijuana, less than 300 grams. Pero kung big time, hindi ka pwede mag plea bargaining. Okay? Second. Another example is that you are a visitor in a drug den. You are apprehended. That's violation of Section 7 of the Dangerous Drugs Law. You could plea bargain to Section 15, use, subject, of course, to the threshold of, of the uh, drugs required. Or you could also plead guilty to Section 12, possession of equipment or apparatus and other drug paraphernalia. Yan, yan, yan. Yun po yung except, uh, examples that we could look into. So now I would want to be very clear that the bargaining is allowed in criminal cases. Of course, in certain cases, and if you're interested in this, you could get hold of Department Order or Department of Justice Circular 061 of 2017. That will be very helpful for you. Okay? Now, let us now proceed to another topic. And before I proceed to that topic, please take note that under the expanded uh, provision, under Rule 130, on uh, plea of guilt to a lesser offense or plea of guilt later withdrawn, the amendment now provides, the amendment is now very clear, that any statement made in the course of the plea bargaining or a statement by reason of a withdrawal of a plea of guilt, late, of a plea of guilt which was later withdrawn, that cannot be taken against the accused. That is found in Rule 1. Let us now proceed with suspension of arraignment. Ako, lahat ng mga practitioner, lalo na pag-abogado ng akusado, yan ang tinatanong. At kailangan, alam natin yan, that's found in Rule 116, Section 11. And for students listening to us, you also have to take note of this. As ordinarily, an arraignment should not be suspended. But an arraignment can be suspended for the following reasons. Number one, the accused is of unsound mind. So he wouldn't really know what he is, what? Entering into. So he's of unsound mind. Number two, there is a prejudicial question. So suspended yan. Tandaan po niya. And pangatlo, is a petition for review. And by the mere filing of a petition for review with the Department of Justice, can you take note, what with that with the Office of the Prosecutor, with the Department of Justice, that suspends the arraignment for a period of 60 days. I recall someone inquiring from me a couple of days ago. Sabi, gusto raw nila mag-file ng MR. So, Allah, we will file an MR before going on a petition for review. Ang tanong ko, ano ba objective mo? Magka-file daw muna siya ng MR doon sa Office of the Prosecutor because he thought that that was a precondition to a petition for review. The answer is no. Even if you look at NPS 70 of the Department of Justice, that is not a requirement. But if you want to, you do it. But if your objective, I ask if, if your objective is to be able to suspend the arraignment, then you file a petition for review because it will suspend the arraignment for a period of 60 days per express provision of them. And according to the case of Dawai, these are the grounds affirmed by the Supreme Court. Let us now proceed, and there are no other grounds, huh? to, the next, to the next topic, archiving of cases. And this is a practitioner's lingo. This is a practitioner's lingo. Why do I say this? Because even if you look at the provision of the rules of criminal procedure, you will not find archiving. In fact, I learned of this uh, concept from my father during the time that he was still a prosecutor before he became a judge. The archiving kasi po, ang nangyayari yan, if the case has been uh, pending, the criminal case has been pending for how long? The accused remains at large for six months. Remember, he has been at large for six months from delivery of the warrant of arrest to the law enforcement officer. So deliver the warrant of arrest to the law enforcement officer, but the person, the accused, has not yet been arrested for six months. And kindly take note that the accused should not have been arraigned, archived. But there are other instances that would lead to archiving. Other instances that would lead to archiving. Ano po yun? Number one, yung diniscuss natin, unsound mind accused. Number two, Prejudicial question. Number three, 
when an incident of the criminal case was elevated to the next level court and the petitioner was able to get a temporary restraining order or preliminary injunction, naturally, the lower court cannot proceed. So the case could be archived. Okay. And finally, when the accused what? When the accused jumps bail. When the accused jumps bail before he is arraigned. Before he is arraigned. And, and let me share with you this uh, one of these learnings that I had as a young lawyer. Alam niyo po, balang nga, pagbago ng abogado, yung concept mo talagang batas. And, and uh, we have this uh, sometimes wrong notion that it's always best to have a criminal case. That is the, but that's not always the case. So when there is, let's say, in a case involving a uh, criminal negligence, which could also be subject to a civil case for damages, nagkaroon ng collision, didimanda ko yung driver. Yes, you may be successful. You will be able to find, uh, show the office of the prosecutor there's probable cause by reason of this criminal negligence. But what happens? That driver will run immediately after the warrant of arrest. And even before the warrant of arrest is to be issued, he runs away. Sabihin, magprovincia ka muna. And again, even if you're able to get a, 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 the information filed in court in the warrant of arrest issue, nothing will happen to you. It will sleep. Because he what? He ran away before the arraignment. And it has been pending for six months. The warrant has been there, not effective, not enforced. Then there will, the case will be out. Let us now move on to another uh, interesting concept, which is waiver of reading of information. Uh, waiver of reading. Ah, hindi pala. Napunta na ako sa waiver. Right. Speedy trial po muna tayo. Nagmamadali ako masyado. Speedy trial and speedy disposition. Now, there is some sort of a mix. There is some sort of a confusion when we talk of speedy trial and speedy disposition. Kindly take note that speedy trial is provided for under the rule on criminal procedure. And this was further enhanced by the Supreme Court in the guidelines on continuous trial. But of course, the precursor of all of this is the Speedy Trial Act. But today, ang tinitignan po natin dyan is criminal procedure. And if we just look at the provision on criminal procedure, you could only invoke speedy trial at any time before trial. If the periods mandated for arraignment to trial has not taken place or was not observed. So it was not as effective. So what the Supreme Court did was to extend it in the entire proceeding in the trial court. Therefore, what did the guidelines tell us? Arraignment and pre-trial for ordinary offenses should have taken place within 30 days. Then trial for the, both the prosecution and the accused should have taken place within a period of 180 days. Okay? 180 days. And the rendition of judgment or promulgation of judgment from the presentation of the accused or when the accused closed or terminated its presentation of evidence would be 90 days to promulgation of judgment. So effectively, the entire criminal procedure should be for a period of less than one. Ayon, yun na yung intention. So pag nagtagal dito, tumagal ng dalawang taon, tatlong taon, apat taon, you could invoke speedy trial under the guidelines of speedy trial. But of course, if you are the prosecution, you should be quick to defend yourself. Bakit? You should be quick to defend yourself because there is a provision in criminal procedure which is known as exclusions. This is found in Rule 119, if I'm not mistaken. Rule 119, Section maybe three or four exclusions. And what are those exclusions? Those grounds which the prosecution can claim that valid grounds for delay. Although now the only grounds for delay would be act of God, force majeure, okay, physical inability to appear. But of course, if the accused is of unsound mind, these are delays that you cannot avoid. Okay, pendency of some other cases, delays that you cannot avoid. So these are realities that the prosecution should be able to invoke. So that the case of the prosecution should not be dismissed. How about speedy disposition? Unlike speedy, dis unlike speedy trial, speedy disposition is found under Article 3, Section 16 of our Constitution. And please take note the speedy disposition applies to administrative, quasi-judicial, and judicial. That's why you will find numerous cases that this is applied, speedy disposition, in the Ombudsman, in administrative cases. Marami po tayo nagkita niya because these are administrative performing quasi-judicial agencies, uh, quasi-judicial functions. So here, 
the speedy disposition under the Constitution can be invoked. And in actual judicial cases, criminal cases, you can invoke that before trial, during trial, and even during its pendency before the appellate court. And that is how vast the effect of speedy disposition. So kindly take note, which would you really want to use? Because sometimes practitioners use this interchangeably. Thank you. Now let us now proceed to waiver of reading of information. Waiver of reading of information. What about waiver of reading of information? Okay. And uh, again, forgive me for always saying this. I say practitioners know this. Sometimes what practitioners will do, okay, sabi ni Jad, okay, read the information. Tawag yan ng mga practitioners. Basa, binabasahan na yung kliyente ko. O sabi ni Jad, so read the information. And then the, the, the lawyer will say, Your Honor, I would like to waiver, uh, just a waiver of the reading of the information. So your client will be uh, entering a plea of guilty or not guilty. In the past, this has been the practice. But this was put to question. Why? Was it compliant with the requirements of the Constitution? Did it actually protect the right of the accused? Because the minimum requirement of the Constitution is to inform the accused of the nature and cause of accusation against him. Kaya po yan binabasa sa kanya. Allowed. Kaya po ako, pag ako may kaso, kahit gano'ng kahaba, yan pinababasa ko. Basahin niyo yan. Okay. However, please take note that under the guidelines on continuous trial, there is an express provision now on waiver of the reading of information. And the objective of the same is to expedite pro proceedings, but not in any way to destroy the rights of the accused. And let me explain this to you. You could only allow a waiver of the reading of the information by the accused, meaning the court may only allow the waiver of the reading of the information by the accused when, when the court is convinced that the accused fully understands and express consents to the waiver of the reading of the information. So the judge may ask, you know, the consequences of the same. And you consent, and not only should the accused consent, but likewise his counsel. I will repeat, not only the accused would consent, but likewise his counsel. And please take note further that it is not enough that we orally consent in open court. It is required that it should appear in the minutes of the proceeding, in the certificate of arraignment, or I will repeat, in the minutes of arraignment or certificate of arraignment and the order of arraignment. That is to make sure that no one could question that the rights of the accused has been violated. So please take note of that. But again, tinanong ko to in one of my examination, the accused was absent. The accused was absent. And because the accused was absent, what the judge did, what the judge did was, okay, waiver of the reading of the information, enter a plea for the accused. Can the judge do that? Of course not. Because for this to apply, the accused should be present in court. However, kindly take note of the provisions on environmental cases, criminal procedure. If that is an undertaking or a condition under your bail, that could happen. There could be a waiver and the court could enter a plea. It is different. So for those of you who are interested, you could look at to compare the rules on environmental cases in criminal procedure. But for ordinary procedure, please take note, there could only be a waiver of the reading of the information if the accused is physically present in court. And the accused consents, and the accused consents together with his counsel. Now let's move on to the next point, the next topic. This is now another uh, interesting. Attorney, puro interesting. <laughs> Alam niyo, pinili ko talaga ito yung, uh, to my... Uh, Based on my experience, yung feel ko na I think lawyers will also need this, but students, you also need this. These are uh, part of your coverage for purposes of the bar exams. Okay, now, let's look at this. Attorney, meron ba yan? Alam nyo kasi yan, nag-evolve yan eh, but I have to uh, give you a little background. As you know, under Rule 130, an offer of compromise by an accused in a criminal case is an implied admission of liability. You know that for lawyers and for uh, law students. However, the Supreme Court realized, and this is a long history, mediation is a long history. I remember this being tried late in the 90s up until the early 2000, and there were even actual data showing how effective this is. 
So this was made part of the guidelines of the continuous trial. And they've actually collated all of those offenses which are mediatable, if I may call it. Although wala naman talaga ng mediatable, but they have called it mediatable. Or those cases that could be subject of mediation. Now, let me enumerate some. But I would like you to refer to the guidelines on continuous trial to have a complete list of this. Number one, BP-22. Number number one, BP-22. The next one is non-remittance of SSS. Pag premium, pag-ibig premiums, libel, slander, simple slander, grave slander, estafa. But kindly take note, only estafa 315A, but 315B and 2 and 3 is not included. Is not included. The next is other deceits or other forms of swindling, including criminal negligence. But this is not everything. But what I'm trying to tell you are these are the common offenses which are what we call subject to mediation. But please take note, and this is in relation to the next topic. Under the present rule, and this is the brainchild of our present Chief Justice, Peralta. Ang suggestion niya rito, we have to complete the pre-trial proper before we go to mediation. Because the problem in the past was, after arraignment, before pre-trial proper, mediation. And that could be a, a delay of the case for three to four months. But with this procedure now, after arraignment, pre-trial immediately, and once the issues have been identified that's pre-trial proper, okay, pre-trial proper, only then can you go to mediation. And the maximum period to resolve matters referred to by mediation is a period of 30 days. In fact, a former judge asked me, sabi niya, pa paano yung JDR? Okay? Nasa libro ko rin po yung discuss ko. Kasi maganda yung tanong na yun. How about JDR? If you read the provisions on the rules on continuous trial, continuous trial, passed by the Supreme Court, it appears that there will be no JDR because it only says that uh, trial, then pre-trial proper, and then mediation. Let's see how this will evolve. And now, before I leave this topic of mediation, sasabihin mo, attorney, nang hangin niya. It's not so clear. So can I compromise criminal cases? Subject of mediation. Strictly, I, the answer is yes. I don't need to say strictly speaking. Let me explain. Because what was subject of the compromise, of the mediation, is only the civil aspect. But kindly take note, take note, no one in his right mind will agree to settle and pay you on the civil aspect also. There is an expectation that you will also drop the criminal case. But again, that's against public policy. Right? That's against public policy. Because at that point in time, that's already the case of the state. So what happens? Now the offended party, the complainant, is just a witness for the state. What he will do is to prepare an affidavit of desistance because he's entered already into a compromise. And usually when you talk of BP-22 or you talk of uh, or even libel or slander, there was misunderstanding, there was really no intention to do that. The crime was not committed, so definitely the, the witness will be allowed to sit on the stand. He will be allowed to sit on the stand. And then the judge will have to examine if it was voluntarily made, if he gave it assistance. And once the judge is convinced, the prosecution will have to move for the dismissal of the case. Why the prosecution? Because for double jeopardy to attach, it should be the prosecution. Any dismissal of the accused, okay, any dismissal with express consent of the accused will not lead to double jeopardy. And that is a lesson I learned as a young lawyer in court, in the sala of Judge Pia. Now, retired Supreme Court Justice Pia. Yan po yun. Alala ko, nung ako inalalayan, nagpa, nagkaroon ako ng ano, nagkaroon ako ng uh, yung aking pasado, the systems, and then padidiscuss na. Sabi, you know, what will you do? Yeah, I was a very young lawyer. And then, only to realize that the accused should have been first arraigned. And I should not move for the dismissal. It should be the prosecution. Okay, now let's move on to the next topic. Let's move on to the next. The next topic would be, I'm done with court annex mediation. Let's proceed to discharge of an accused as a state witness. Are we on schedule? Oh, we're very much on schedule. We're very much on schedule. Discharge of an accused as a state witness. Again, very interesting and important topic to be asked in examinations. First question, when do you apply 
for a discharge of an accused as a state witness. This is found in Rule 119, Section 17, if I'm not You have to apply for this at any time before the prosecution rests. Because if the prosecution has already rested its case, he doesn't need this testimony anymore. Okay? And number two, the accused who is to be discharged as a state witness will have to submit his affidavit in court, and he will have to be scrutinized, tested in court. Now, what happens if the court rejects him as a state witness? What happens to the affidavit? And all of the testimony that he gave in the meantime, it will be what? Rendered inadmissible. You don't have to worry. Now, what are the requisites? And another thing before I proceed, that accused should first be arraigned. Because the effect of a discharge is at a point. So he should first be arraigned. What are the requisites? Number one, there is absolute necessity, meaning it's really needed. I had a case like that. It was a robbery case. Wala kami testigo. Wala kami testigo when I was a young lawyer and I was an assistant lawyer then. Uh, they agreed. The, the, the lead counsels agreed. Uh, the, the more senior lawyers agreed to a uh, discharge of an accused as a state witness because there is absolute necessity. And who was this? He was the lookout. Second, there is no direct evidence. There is no one who could really point to the perpetrators of the crime. All that we had then was inferences, circumstances. But once we had this, the very moment we had this accused who was discharged as a state witness, then we had it. But kindly take note, the discharged witness, accused, should not be the most guilty. I will repeat, he should not be the most guilty. Now you'll ask me, attorney, pwede bang isa, dalawa? Well, you could have two, you could have three, for as long as you do not discharge the principal perpetrators. There is no limit as to the numbers, but usually the maximum is to the demon. But they should be what? Not the most guilty. And the next one is it should have been corroborated in its material form, meaning it should be consistent with the basic story, and it cannot just stand alone, and therefore it's untruthful. And finally, he's not been convicted, that's the accused who is discharged, has not been convicted of a crime involving moral turpitude. An interesting question that may be raised would be this. Sabi mo, Pero hindi ba meron yung, ano, yung witness protection program? Yes. But that's under the different law. Under the law on the witness protection program. And when you apply for that, the case is not yet in court. You apply for that where? In the Department of Justice. It will be the secretary who will decide on this. But the good thing for students, the requisites are the same. Except that, that the person who is discharged as a state witness and would fall under the witness protection program is already excluded in the information. Excluded in the information. But kindly take note, don't be misled. There is such a provision, exclusion, Rule 110, Section 14. When you talk of exclusion and in that concept, it means that that accused was included in the information, but the prosecution was convinced that they cannot prove the case against this person. In the meantime, we will exclude you. That's within the power of the prosecution. Upon leave of court, we notice to the offended party. Let us now move on to conditional examination of witnesses. Okay? Conditional examination of witnesses for the accused and witnesses for the prosecution. Yeah. Witnesses for the accused, witnesses for the prosecution. I'm just checking kung ilang pang topic natin. Okay? Uh, conditional examination. Please take note. That's why I'm discussing this all at the same time. You know why? Because this is found in Rule 119, Section 12, 13, and 15. And I will tell you, for jurisprudence, this is the equivalent of deposition in criminal cases. Therefore, do not use Rule 23 when you have a criminal case. Sasabihin mo, for example, naku, may sakit na yung kliyente ko. May, uh, the, the witness is dying and I think uh, he'll just live for a number of months. We need to get his testimony. Then the question is, is he the, test, is, is he the witness of the accused? If he's the witness for the accused, the grounds for conditional examination is number one, sick or infirm, or number two, more than 100 kilometers from the place of the hearing, and despite exercise of diligence, cannot appear in court. So those are the grounds. So in that case, you could conduct what? A conditional examination 
of the witness for the prosecutor for the accused. But please take note, this conditional examination of witnesses for the accused will only take place before trial. Because if it's already trial, you will simply ask the court, pakiunahin na lang ito. So, the trial is still far away, and this is the condition of the witness for the accused, sick or infirm, or more than 100 kilometers, despite due diligence cannot come to court. In other similar circumstances, you could ask the court to conduct where? A conditional examination ahead of the trial. Where? Before whom? Before any judge. That's the benefit given to the accused. Before any judge. Number two, before any member of the bar in good standing. And number three, before an inferior court if directed by a superior or an advocate. Now, is that right also available to the, uh, to the prosecution? Yes, it's also available. And it happened to one of my cases, I recall. Sabi nung isa kong testigo, a couple of years or a decade ago, sabi niya, attorney, nakuha na ako ng kontrata sa, sa Saudi. Oy, papano? He's an accountant. Kaya e, alis na po ako next month. But trial is not yet uh, next month. It may take uh, six months before the trial. E, I have a contract, attorney. Can you help me? So, can you use this? Yes, you could use this. Because the grounds under the provision of the law is number one, your witness is sick or infirm. And number two, your witness is about to depart with no definite day of return. So what I did was to ask the court, Your Honor, can we have conditional examination? But please take note that when it comes to the prosecution witnesses, the law is strict. Why? Conditional examination of witnesses can only take place in the court where the action is pending. Next, let us move on to the next topic. Demur to evidence. We are now on demur to evidence. What about demur to evidence? Please take note that demur to evidence is found in Rule 100, if I'm not mistaken, Rule 119, Section 23. And again, I would like to remind you that uh, leave is significant, although not, not mandatory for criminal cases. Criminal practitioners know that leave is important. Wag po kayo magpapalan demur to evidence and criminal na hindi kayo nagsisik ng leave of court, papapahamak ang kliyente nyo. Because if you file demur to evidence without seeking leave of court in a criminal case and the court denies the demur of the accused, the court can already render a judgment. So a criminal lawyer, law practitioner, will always have to remember if he opts to file a, a, a demur to evidence, which is a, a sometimes a strategy of some lawyers after the presentation of the plaintiff's evidence, they file the murder evidence. Please seek leave, although it's not mandatory. Now, kindly take note that under the guidelines on pretrial and modes of discovery, please take note. Hindi pala guidelines on pretrial modes of discovery, nalilito na ako. Guidelines on continuous trial. Lahat po na sinabi kong guidelines, continuous trial po dapat. On guidelines on continuous trial, leave can now be sought orally. So after the presentation of witness of the prosecution, you could tell the court, your Honor, can I seek leave of court and argue? And then the court can also resolve your leave orally. But you could opt to file it also in writing. Now, if the court grants you leave, within how many days should you file your demur to evidence? Meaning the court can find sense in your filing demur to evidence. Within what period of time? You could file it within a non-extendable period of 10 days. And of course, the prosecution will be given 10 days to, to comment if he wants to. But if he doesn't want to comment, within a period of what, 10 days, or from expiration of that period to comment, the court can already resolve the demur to evidence. Please take note of that. The court can already resolve the demur to evidence. Let us now proceed to, so please take note of those, huh? so demur to evidence, and please take note, just like a final word on demur to evidence, huh? please take note of this. You cannot question a denial of a demur to evidence in criminal cases on by appeal or petition for certiorari up until the termination of the case. Up until the termination of the case. You cannot, let's say you receive a denial, oh, petition for certiorari. No, appeal. No, that's prohibited in criminal cases. And please take note, under the amendment in civil procedure of May 2020, that is already prohibited also, even in civil cases. Next topic is motions. We are now on motions in civil and criminal cases. 
And uh, I've received a number of questions when it comes to motions. So please give attention to this. I will distinguish civil and criminal in the light of the amendment of Rule 15. Let me start with criminal. And I will take it from the guidelines on pre-trial. I will take it from the guidance, guidelines on continuous trial passed by the Supreme Court. As I said a while ago, there is what you call non-meritorious. That's the classification of criminal case now, criminal cases now. Non-meritorious and meritorious. If it is a meritorious motion, the other party will be required to comment within a period of 10 days. No hearing anymore. 10 days to comment. And thereafter, after the lapse of that period, the court will have to resolve it also within a period of 10 days. 10 days. Yeah. How about in civil cases? In civil cases, you have a period of five days to comment. And that is not called meritorious. It is called litigious motions. Litigious motions like motion for bill of particulars, motion to dismiss, discretionary execution. These are what we call litigious motions in civil cases. The other party, without hearing, will file his comment if he wants to within a period of five days. If there is no comment or the period lapses, the judge will have to resolve the litigious motion within a period of 15 days. Mas mahaba have a period in civil cases, 15 days. And whether or not it's civil or criminal, there is no more any requirement of a notice. There is no longer a requirement of a notice of hearing. And please take note, the guidelines for continuous trial has a special provision on motion for reconsideration for meritorious motions. So if you file meritorious motion, like a motion to quash, and it's denied, you could file an MR, but your MR is five days only. The other party could comment five days, and the court will have to resolve that motion after the lapse of the period to file uh, a comment of the other party, if he didn't file one, or after he filed it, five days to resolve it. So I hope that's clear. We should have no confusion. And in addition to that, please take note, it is now fully recognized, consistent with expediting proceedings in court, that there could be oral motions in open court in the light of Rule 15, and judges will have to resolve it also in open. The next topic is appeals from decisions of the Sandigan Bayan. Okay. For those of you, this will be interesting for those who have cases in the Sandigan Bayan. And I would like to call your attention to the 2018 revised internal rules of the Sandigan Bayan. Bago po ito, the, the revised internal rules of the Sandigan Bayan for 2018. And I would like to call your attention to the modes of appeal from decision of the Sandigan Bayan. They actually simplified it. Very easy to remember. So if the, in a criminal case, the Sandigan Bayan rendered a decision in the exercise of its original jurisdiction, the mode of appeal is notice of appeal. If the Sandigan Bayan, in the exercise of its appellate jurisdiction, will have to appeal where? To the Supreme Court on a Rule 45. On a Rule 45. Then the third, when is their automatic appeal? Whenever the Sandigan Bayan, in the exercise of what? Original jurisdiction, imposes the penalty of death. It sees that the penalty is death. What will it do? It will forward the records to the Supreme Court so that the Supreme Court will review it on automatic review. Thank you. The next topic, we're almost done. Nasa huling ano na po tayo ata, slide eh. Yes, we're on our last slide. Are we on schedule? Very much on schedule. Precautionary hold departure order. This is new, and I think this is a very good rule that was passed by the Supreme Court. It is AM number 18-0705-SC. And why I, why did I say that it's a very good rule? Sana hindi kayo nasisilo sa akin, ano ha? Sige po. Why do I say, asensya na, ayan. why do I say it's a very, ayan. atras po na konti, why do I say that it is a very good rule? Because in the past, there is some sort of a gap. A gap from the time the case is filed with the Office of the Prosecutor up until the information is filed. That would depend on how fast the Office of the Prosecutor is. It could be fastest three months. It could be a delay of a year. So during that period of time, 
that person, the respondent in the office of the prosecutor could run away. Tatakbo ang kanya, pwede nang lumipad yan. Why? Because before this circular, before this circular of the Supreme Court, only the RTC can issue a whole departure order when the action is already pending before them. And the Sandigan Bayan, according to the case of Defense of Santiago versus Vasquez, is recognized to issue a whole departure order. But there is that gap wherein respondents who will eventually become accused will already run away. That is why there was that controversy about the circular issued by the Department of Justice, Circular 41, which was declared unconstitutional because of this gap, right? Because the DOJ would want to stop people from uh, leaving the country. So this is why we have the precautionary hold departure. So when will this happen? It will happen when the prosecutor handling the case has an initial determination of probable cause based on the complaint filed before him, affidavit complaint, and he files the same before the court, okay? Regional trial court, where within whose territorial jurisdiction the crime was committed. Or within the judicial region, if the place of commission is known for a compelling reason. But kindly take note, if it is the NBI, National Bureau of Investigation, who is applying for it, you could apply for it in Manila, Quezon City, Pasig, Makati, yan. Ay, ulitin ko ay, Manila, Quezon City, Cebu, Iloilo, Dabao, Cagendo. I will repeat, Regional Trial Court of Manila, Quezon City, Cebu, Iloilo, Dabao, and Cagendo. Who is applying? If Who is applying is the National Bureau of Investigation. But if others, then you have to go to the place the prosecutor will have to file it well in the place where the crime generally was committed. So here, only those offenses subject of a precautionary hold departure order are those offenses which carry a penalty of at least six years. Okay, six years. Is at least six years and one day. Six years, obviously exceeding six years because six years and one day. Let us now move on to the next topic. The next topic is, yes, scattershot warrant, okay? Let us now touch on scattershot warrant. Plain and simple, when you apply for a search warrant, which is effective for only 10 days, and this is under Rule 126, I'm referring to a search with a warrant. Kindly take note that the requirement of the rule is one search warrant, one offense. Yan lang po yan, para information, one offense, one information, one offense. Pag search warrant, you cannot have multiple offenses in one search warrant. That is clear because that, that is the right of a person who is subjected to search. And that is even respected by the Constitution. Now, please take note. Please take note that if there are multiple counts of an offense, like in the case of Colombia versus Puerto Rico, it's a copyright infringement with several counts. And in the course of the search, what was uncovered was a contraband of pirated tapes. The Supreme Court said that it still fell within the definition of a single offense in one search warrant. Another is an interesting case, the case of Laud versus People. The case of Laud versus People. This is a uh, this was a uh, a series of killings committed in Davao, and it involved six counts of murder. And it was applied, if I'm not mistaken, the search warrant was in Manila, and it was questioned. And the court. What? Set aside this original grant of search warrant. It went up to the Supreme Court. The CA reversed it. It went up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, there's nothing wrong with the search warrant because that was what was subject to the search warrant was the murder. The murder. And though there were six counts, that still fell within the definition of one offense. That's a case of Laud. Okay. Laud versus people. And this is very interesting for students. Please read this. Why? Because it also touched on description of the place. In that case, if I remember it right, the description of the place was Purok 3, Ma'a, and these were caves inside the Laud compound. Ganun lang, walang numero, wala lahat. Sabi dito, in fact, in the question and answer before the judge of Manila, the description was, ang sabi was, 13, minute, 13 meters from the first grave, you will find the deceased. The Supreme Court said that that was a sufficient description. The Supreme Court said that was a sufficient description of the place to be searched. And therefore, the search warrant was valid. 
The next one that I would like to discuss would be a cyber, work to apply for a cyber warrant. And this, uh, to some, will be very interesting in the light of the Cyber Crime Protection Act of 2012. Where can you apply for a cyber, for a cyber warrant? Please take note that you could apply for a cyber warrant in the place where the computer device can be found, in the place where the, the crime was committed or the elements thereof was committed, or in the place where damage was suffered by the grief, whether a natural person or a juridical person. And then Puyon. But can you take note, in the same provision, Cyber Warrant Tool of the Supreme Court, it enumerated the courts where you could apply for it, and that will be effective in the entire Philippines, enforceable, can you take note, not only in the Philippines, but outside of the Philippines. Very interesting. Where could you apply? Manila, Makati, Pasig, Cebu, Iloilo, of course, Quezon City, I miss out there on. Dabao and Cagayan de Oro. These are the places. And if you apply again in Quezon City, Manila, Pasig, Bacati, Cebu, Iloilo, Cagayan de Oro, and Dabao, this is what? Effective in the entire Philippines, even outside, okay? Nationwide and even outside. Now, let us look at how about, how about, and this is my last point. Again, you know, on the extension, last point. How to apply? What is this? Search warrants. For those of you who are confronted with this problem, please refer to Section 2. Please refer to Section 2 of Rule 126. You can apply for it in the place within whose territorial jurisdiction the crime is to be committed. That is why there is this mistaken notion that search warrant application is consistent with the concept of venue is jurisdictional. But this was stricken down in the case of Shell Philippines. But again, to avoid problems, it would be best to apply for it in the place within whose territorial jurisdiction the crime was committed. Okay, please take note of that. And second, for compelling reason, you could go outside of that territorial jurisdiction, but within the judicial region, if the place of commission is identified, identified, and it will be enforced in that judicial region. But please take note, there is an exception. If you apply in Manila, Manila, or in Quezon City, Manila or in Quezon City. Please take note. If you apply for uh, a search warrant involving illegal gambling, illegal drugs, heinous crime, violation of the anti-money laundering law, violation of intellectual property law, this is per circle of the Supreme Court, that search warrant is effective in the entire Philippines, issued by Manila Executive Judge or Quezon City Executive Judge. And that was even applied because it was in the case of Laud versus people that I discussed a while ago. And these applications could also be applied by NBI, PNP, or the PAO. I think we have covered what we have to cover. Uh, maraming salamat for your patience. We have covered much for this afternoon. Thank you. I'm ready to answer questions. I will... Uh, I exceeded by two... Uh, by two minutes, sorry. Ito, nandito na ata lahat. Let me read, let me read. Para tayo nasa isang programa. Okay. Sabi niya dito. In crimes involving penalties of imprisonment of less than four years, two months, uh, and one day, can you file a motion for investigation if the prosecutor did not find probable cause? Seems abogado rin tanong ito. Sabi ko nga, in, yan, no? so they, they're flashing it there. You know, uh, you cannot ask for preliminary investigation if there is no requirement of preliminary investigation. You cannot ask for preliminary investigation. As I immediately mentioned a while ago, you have to ask me for four. If there is a requirement of preliminary investigation, if it's below four years, two months, and one day, it does not require preliminary investigation. Therefore, the court will throw it away. The court will deny it. But again, I'm not saying that all judges will do it. Some judges actually entertain it, but you just have to refer to the guidelines on continuous time. Because the question is straightforward. Below four years, two months, and one day, does that require preliminary investigation? If I am the judge, you file a motion for investigation in my sala, I will deny it. The next question. 
is the doctrine of inordinate delay applicable to the office of the prosecutor. If you follow speedy disposition, oh, magaganda ito mga kaso nyo, no? naiinip na siguro kayo, okay? naiinip na kayo sa mga kaso nyo, inordinate delay. And, and I always tell my students, that they always they, that they remember the the phrase inordinate delay and in addition to inordinate delay vexatious capricious and oppressive delays inordinate delay this has been used in the office of the ombudsman i see no reason why you cannot raise it in the office of the prosecutor because you will have to invoke invoke if you will use this speedy disposition under article 3 of the constitution this could be used for judicial quasi judicial and administrative cases Eh, kung mga limang taon na yun, violation yun. And I know there are jurisdictions to that effect. Let us now look at, uh, is, it, is it possible that while the accused has been detained, he could put up the bail even if not yet arraigned? Uh, alam nyo, uh, good question. Good question. Hindi naman requirement yung arraignment. Arraignment is not a requirement. I just mentioned that for purposes of those non-bailable offenses. Dahil sa gravity nun, nakita ng guidelines, kailangan ma-arrain at mag-pre-trial. Sigurado yung mag-pre-trial niya. Because ang bigat ng aso. And I told you a while ago, in the case of Serapio versus Abdi Gatayan, an arraignment is not required. But we're talking here, sabi niya, is it possible if the accused has been detained? I would like to assume, for to, to discuss further the question, yung let's say, uh, hindi lang talaga ano, na-arresto without a warrant. Itenado siya. And let's paint a picture that the information is not yet been forwarded. There are situations like that on inquest where the prosecutor says, inquest prosecutor says, detain, detain mo yan. And then he's, he applied for, an, for a uh, preliminary investigation within Article 125. So naturally, the case will not kick in. It will not be forwarded to the court. There will be no information. But you are detained. Can you apply? Can you apply? Uh, if I am not mistaken, for those of you who have this problem, uh, there is that circular that applies to executive judges. I know that they have the power to do that, and you have to apply for that. Although me, as a practitioner, I shy away from that because it's not clear in the provision below. I'll be relying on a circular. But I know that such circular exists for executive judges. So what I usually do in a situation like that, I would want that an information be filed, and only then, within five days from the knowledge of the filing of the information, I will file for a preliminary investigation. So that the records will be returned. At the same time, he will be released. On it's a different story, of course, if the bail is, if it's an unbailable offense, there will be hearings. On the so it will take time before the court will grant it. Okay? Can the office of the president prevent the court to issue a warrant of arrest pursuant to uh, AO 22 series of 2011, appeal to the office of the president. You know, uh, uh, he's referring to appeal to the office of the president. One is the executive office of the president. The other one is the uh, judiciary. You know, this has been clearly laid in the case of Crespo versus Mogul. Okay? The case of Crespo versus Mogul. The court, once the information is there, that's completely within its jurisdiction. In fact, even if the DOJ decides to dismiss it, all that they could do is to file a motion, not to take action. That's a way of minimum. Because the judiciary is a separate, it's a separate branch of government, clearly made in the case of Crespo versus Mongol. And I honestly, I rarely use that going to the office of the president because I know the problem that I will be faced with. It will, I will not prevent the issuance of the warrant to the president. Although, to this extent, I will uh, tell you, I would recall that sometime in the late 80s, during the time that we are uh, President was still President Corazon Aquino. There were certain offenses like well, the penalties death that will have to go up to the office of the president for review. But I, that's the utmost that I could remember at this time. Okay? Now, finally, finally, are there any acts uh, which will have the effect of validating an illegal arrest? Can they still question the legality of the arrest even when they post bail? Yeah, good question. Pwede mo para kanyang question. Remember, this has already been asked in the bar exams. Uh, rule 114, last section. You could question the legality of the arrest at any time before the accused enters plea. And it happens, sometimes, nauna yung pagpiyansa eh. 
papiansahan yan. Although there's some judges, pag, if, the, if, the, if the judge grants the bail, there's some judges, okay, I'll arrange you now. Okay? That's why sometimes you, you shy away from those types of judges. Yeah. In the ordinary course of things, the judge grants bail, the next setting may be two weeks from now, or the fastest would be a week later, that you have flexibility to question the legality before plea. So that would not, your application for bail, and that's my answer, for us, your application for bail will not in any way prevent you from questioning the legality of the arrest for as long as your client is not yet ended. Okay, that will be the last question. Oh, thank you very much. Oh, we're done. We're done with the Q&A. Thank, yeah, thank, thank you, Attorney Tranquil. Thank you, am I live there? Thank you, Attorney Tranquil. That was very informative and very crucial. I suppose you you would agree with me that you know a lot of injustices really happen when the lawyers have a misappreciation of our criminal procedure rules. And so this yeah. would really I hope oh I hope that they are listening well. No, not just the not just the the uh, practitioners, also the students. And I would like to think because your explanation is very clear that you know even non-lawyers. Those who have pending cases, sana ho, I hope, I hope, I hope, yes. Oh, sana it, you're listening because this would to help us. you understand better when your, law, when your lawyer explains to you or sometimes you can yes. also call their attention na, teka, parang hindi ganun yes. yung sinabi ni attorney Salvador. Ay, sandali lang, <laughs> din Mari. Huwag nyo lang naman tuturuan si attorney. Your lawyer oh, knows oh, what's best for you. Nako, but it's always a little knowledge good. is so scary. Yes, <laughs> a little, sometimes it's dangerous to have a little knowledge because clients will argue with the lawyer. It, oh, we have a lawyer, lot of data, ha? maraming you. ganyan. <laughs> yeah, the, I, as a young lawyer, there was a lawyer, there was a client of mine who was telling me, attorney, uh, binibili niya ako ng mga libro, basahin mo to ha. Tapos sabi niya, <laughs> in fact, there was a question to me. But this was a civil case. Sabi niya, attorney, uh -huh. there, was a, there is a famous columnist and our case was a contractual dispute. You know, he always discusses uh, uh, contracts. We might want to get him as an expert witness. I told him, the judge should know the law. So we can call him to witness that. <laughs> oh, pwede mo rin sabihin, baka, you know, chances are naging estudyante mo rin yung columnist na yon. Kasi everybody, uh, if ano, hindi ko kayo naging estudyante ni Attorney Tranquil, this is how Attorney Tranquil conducts his classes. So you would know how he keeps the attention of the class and also how they retain the information. Kasi you inject also practical situations. And uh, well, we're, uh, it's a good thing then, Attorney Tranquil, I'd like to say, it's a good thing you mentioned also cyber warrants because um, yeah. according to our bar chairperson for 2020, si Justice Leonin, this will be part of the scope of the bar examinations. So yes. kasama po yan, yung cyber warrants po na yan. All right. Okay. So any. I'd like to say thank you. Thank you also to our viewers who sent their questions. This is very important because it helps the flow of the discussion and also expands so that we will know also from your experiences how we can also explain and apply the law as we have learned it from Attorney Tranquil. Everybody, this go thank you. Thank you so much. This thank concludes you. our session. Thank you. So we started with civil procedure and now we have criminal procedure in action. I hope everybody learned a lot. And um, also we'd like to uh, thank our, um, again, once again, our lecturer for today. And also on behalf of the Ateneo Law Alumni Association, headed by our chairman, Teddy Cruz, our president, Nena Rosales, those who helped with this web lecture series, we have our corporate secretary, attorney Joseph Migrino in the uh, background, and also attorney Mitoy Cayosa, who's also helping us curate and, and uh, the questions. Thank you very much, Anne Vic, and everyone behind the board of trustees. Please do not forget to um, also watch uh, our page so that you will know the upcoming lectures. We will be having updates this time on corporation law. So we would we are very glad to have the chairperson of the Securities and Exchange Commission as our next lecture. So please watch out for the details on that. And with that, we conclude our lecture today. We thank everybody for joining us. I hope you learned a lot and have a good day.